podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to the Hedged Edge by RCM Ag Services, where we're getting out of the field and onto the mic to bring you weekly market updates, commentary from commodity experts, and monthly interviews with the biggest names in agribusiness. Good afternoon. Welcome to the next edition of the Hedged Edge. We're here with our part two of the 2021 outlook. Today, we're going to be addressing the question of where's the beef or where's the pork? Really, what we're going to be talking about today is the meat markets and where they're going for the next year. Obviously, no guarantees or where we're on where things actually will end up. But for today, we're going to actually ha- we're going to have some of our uh, uh, top experts joining us. Today is Kevin Bost from uh, our RCM Ag Services team, as well as Tom Chavez. Kevin, welcome. You've been a longtime listener and a longtime guest to the show. Thank you for joining us again today. And uh, Tom, uh, the, the quite the opposite, longtime listener, but not quite uh, a guest. Today's the first time, welcome. Yeah, thanks, happy to participate. All right, we're gonna have some fun. Uh, the two of you guys have known each other some time going back. Um, we're, we're obviously Zooming today. We're not doing this in person. Before we get going, you know, you've got a picture of the Board of Trade in your background. I've got one behind me. And Kevin, you were just saying before we jumped on the show, you've got uh, something kind of interesting right there on your shelf. Uh, going back prices to the 1800s and meats, what, what's, what's going on? What do you got back there? Corn and, corn and hog prices, yeah, from the Livestock National Bank of Chicago. <laughs> what year was it goes starting? to 1925. Oh, 1925 so was published. 1890 or 1880 when it started. It wasn't that long ago back when this thing was printed. Right, right. Well, uh, you know, I first started in the business uh, to meet some of the old school traders. And uh, they used to tell me how they'd uh, listen uh, or wait for the ticker tapes to kind of rip off uh, information and data from New York or all over the world. The exchanges <clears throat> ultimately used to be the center of gravity uh, for, for commodity markets. And that kind of leads into what we're here to talk about today, which is the center of gravity for our meat team and our meat uh, uh, meat efforts that we're doing, our livestock efforts. Um, Tom, could you give us a little bit of your background and then um, maybe touch on um, how research uh, ties into what we're focused on here in the livestock group? Sure. Um, I started back in the late 80s, um, actually late 80s at a small company called Stotler and immediately uh, met uh, the head of a group that I'd ultimately spent about 22 years with and still very much connected to. Um, but learned the business, uh, I was spent 20 plus years at Rosenthal Collins Livestock Division, group of guys that, uh, you know, their trading decisions were very much based on fundamental analysis. We had a, a person in the group that did the same type of uh, research that Kevin does. Kevin actually knows her pretty well but she trained at Heinold and uh, that's kind of how I cut my teeth, kind of learning from guys that had, you know, some of the guys in the group actually had worked in the Chicago stockyards and then transitioned over to the Merck when they started trading livestock futures. Um, So, you know, I've learned the business from the ground up as a fundamental, uh, you know, uh, you know, from a fundamental standpoint. And, uh, you know, of course we use other tools like technical analysis, but like you said, to start the show, um, you know, what we're presenting to our customers, what we're trying to help our customer, customers with um, is all really driven by Kevin's, you know, research and fundamental analysis. So, um, uh, but yeah, I've been in the business from late, since the late 80s. So it's probably, I don't know, 32, 35 years at this point, but a long 32 time. 32 years young, Tom, you know, keep the, the I don't see any gray hair. So yeah, that's there. great. No, that's good. No, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and Kevin, uh, just a quick reminder of, uh, for everyone, if they don't remember from the last time, last show, our USDA report or um, the last livestock update is, uh, you know, could you talk about your experience and uh, the work you did with uh, Wendy's and others just, you know, Two sentences, uh, your background in meats. 
Okay, well, to make it real short, I started trading. I started trading cattle futures in January 1979. <clears throat> and so I was born in 1978. I was a broker, I was a USDA guy. <laughs> there must be something auspicious about that, I guess. Um, yeah. But I'm a meat guy. I'm a meat guy. I, was work for, I worked for USDA for a few years at the Economic Research Service, but I've been in the meat business directly ever since about 1990. And a few years of that, like you mentioned, Jeff, was with Wendy's as um, their director of supply chain management. So meat is my world. I can't get out. Perfect. Well, hey, let's, listen, we appreciate it um, greatly. Don't, don't, uh, don't let anybody fool you. All right, well, let's jump into it. So, Kevin, you do a ton of research, and you're kind enough to put together a nice presentation today um, showing some data. For anyone who's listening, please be sure to click on the show notes to download the presentation. If uh, you can, jump over to YouTube, and on YouTube, you'll be able to bounce around and uh, see some of these visuals in real time. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, first off is just to go ahead and watch show. Um, technology makes it easy. Here we go. All right, Kevin, you're up. I think uh, everybody can see the screen, and uh, and we're off. So go ahead, Kevin. We're gonna we're gonna kind of leave this to you. And um, all right, let's go. I'll let you know when to flip the page. Thanks. We're trying to cover cattle and hogs both in a pretty short amount of time here. So this stuff is really basic. Of course, if there's something that um, you would you'd see this and you want some explanation or more detail or you disagree with something here, then happy to provide all the detail that you want. Uh, so we'll start with the cattle and beef stuff. Like I said, this is real basic. <laughs> I wanna show you what's kind of laying the groundwork for what's to come as, as best I can tell. What we're looking at here is a picture of the cattle on feed inventory, 150 days or longer. In other words, cattle that have been on feed at least 150 days. And for those of you who are not familiar with the um, <clears throat> industry, the, uh, you know, these days yearling cattle that are placed on feed as yearlings are typically taken, they're spending 150 to 200 days in the feedlot. So this is what you call a front end cattle supply. And the point here is, is first of all, two of them. One is that we got a big front end cattle supply, this inventory of Cattle on feed 150 days or longer is a it's record large for January one, record large for February one. Um, well over a year ago, I think this inventory is up 33 percent from a year ago. February one up about 35 percent uh, on on uh, March one. But the other the other point is that it goes into a steep decline <clears throat> after about March or April. <clears throat> so. This is really laying the groundwork for, for what I'd classify as the bull market in the cattle down the road. You can go ahead and flip it, uh, Jeff. Yep, go ahead. There we go. This, uh, this, <clears throat> this, pattern, this pattern and the front end cattle supply traces back to last spring, really, because we had some big wide swings in placements, the volume of cattle going into feedlots. And when this, when when the when the uh, coronavirus caused a number of big packing plants to shut down, what 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 you did was you plugged up one end of the pipeline. So not only were cattle not moving out of the feedlots and they got backed up with the feedlots, but also cattle were not going in. So you had a backlog of feeder cattle supplies at the same time. When those came out, then we had a big surge in placements right here, July, August, September, where we had big, big numbers of cattle placed on feed. Uh, the other part of that story is that that was followed by a big drop. You know, there's nothing moderate about this pattern in the second half of the year. We had a big drop in placements in the fourth quarter. That's what's driving that big downtrend in, in feedlot inventories that I was showing you a minute ago. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, uh, I thought it would be worthwhile to include uh, export, a picture of the exports in here. These are my projections <clears throat> right at the top. Uh, the, the colors are similar, so they're kind of hard to tell which year is which, but the, the line at the top with the highest volumes is 2021. 
Uh, this is this is what I'd call a persistently supportive factor in the market. I mean, we're looking at uh, exports um, exceeding a year earlier in each quarter, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter. I haven't gone out farther than that yet, but by a pretty fair amount. And the one, the one major export customer that is increasing faster than anyone else is China. Surprise, surprise. The, 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 ex, the beef export business to China is nothing near what it is in pork. But it's kind of a niche market over there because the China's access to what I call high quality grain fed beef got limited choices. And so US beef is starting to fill that hole. That is increasing at a rapid pace. But, you know, in general, uh, still Japan is the biggest export customer, Korea. And China would be two and three, Mexico, Canada. It's really a small number of, of major export customers in the beef. But point is, this is supportive to the market as we go down the road. So go ahead, Jeff. All right. Um, I, I threw this uh, demand projection up there. I'm doing the same for hogs because this is really what drives the cattle and the hog markets in what I'd call the intermediate term, like over periods of two or three months at a time. Uh, meat demand fluctuates quite a bit at the wholesale level. And I should take just a second to explain what it is you're looking at here. Uh, this is a demand index that I put together that uh, measures the strength of demand at the wholesale level, at the, at the, in the wholesale market. It's not the same as retail consumer level demand. This is a seasonally adjusted index. So it kind of me it measures what I might call a core level, core level demand, takes all the seasonality out of it. And you can see some big spikes in there. But oh, by the way, this index is, is, all, is all compared with the 2005 to 2020 average. So it's sort of like the CPI comparing to a base period, only it's a 15 year base period. So. These, these index values that you're looking at here since 2018 are all positive, which means that wholesale demand is above the 15 year average, have been all along. But, you know, we've seen some big spikes in there in the last year and a half. <clears throat> these come along when you get shocks to the market. And in the livestock markets, we've had a couple of big ones in the last year and a half. Uh, one obviously being the, the coronavirus and the plant shutdowns that resulted from that, which also of a sudden created a big shortage of meat. Uh, there was another one going back, um, it sounds like it's ancient history now, but August 2019, when we had a, a fire at one of the biggest beef plants in the country and that was shut down. and. Uh, so you get these spikes, you get these big upward and downward spikes, but uh, for, apart from those spikes, the trend in wholesale beef demand is sideways. There is no uptrend to it, there's no downtrend to it. Another reason why I'm showing you this is, well, first of all, to put my projections in perspective here uh, for, for wholesale beef demand January through September. Uh, secondly, I wanted to point out that despite the dramatic slowdown in restaurant business, there has been no negative impact on wholesale beef demand. It's really hard to believe, but yeah, Kevin, I was just thinking that same thing. We have restaurant demand. We have seventeen percent of restaurants have closed, uh, maybe never to reopen again. But yet, you're forecasting here that uh, we're seeing demand rebounding and maintaining, is that uh, largely simply because everyone is going to then still go back out there into the world post-corona or what, what are we thinking here? It's, it's be, well, it's be, the reason that there has not been any big plunge in wholesale beef demand is because the beef demand that was lost from the restaurant segment, segment has been made up in the grocery stores, in the supermarket segment. My Just Costco about bill agrees. All major supermarket chains are reporting big, like double digit increases in meat sales. 
ever since last uh, April or so. So, you know, the simple answer is that what you've lost from the restaurant sector, you've, you've uh, made back in the retail, in the supermarket. So it's a different kind of demand, but my point is that there has, there has been no negative impact on the demand at the wholesale level. So my projections, when, when I show you these price projections here in a second, keep in mind that I'm projecting kind of a middle of the road rate of wholesale beef demand. Okay, we can look at the next one. Um, this is a chart of weekly cash cattle prices. And I put this up here um, so that you could put the current cash cattle prices in perspective. This market has recovered from very low levels, very cheap levels back here, $95 a hundred weight. That was in, uh, well, it was in July, I think it was of this year. So it's kind of clawed its way back and cattle prices are not expensive. <clears throat> they're, they're, they traded last week just short of 110 per hundred weight. And as you can see here, we hit 125 early in 2020. We hit 130 in 2019. We hit 130 in 2018. So there's room for this market to go up. And cyclically, the uh, cattle supplies are, you know, they've been declining a little bit in the last couple of years. So I know we'll get into it too. The grain prices can't be ignored, you know, 25, 30 40 percent increases are going to find their way into the meat markets at some point great yeah great point great point it, yeah that's that's going to have a it has an impact not only on activity in the feedlot sector but also uh in the on the cow calf ranches so if anything that's going to spur some increased cow slaughter and maybe accelerate the, the slight downtrend that's already in place in the beef cow herd okay. like so you can show the next one. <clears throat> this is my humble guess of what the uh, monthly average cash cattle prices will be. And this is taken, is kind of like Tom mentioned a minute ago. You know, I'm, I'm sort of developing baseline type forecast. This is when, what, what I mean by that is um, taking the information that we, think we know from the government, from all <laughs> sources available at face value. Take it at face value and like I said, kind of keeping the demand projections in the middle of the road, uh, mm -hmm. assuming we have pretty normal marketing rates of cattle out of feedlots, uh, no major shocks down the road, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, you know all of the caveats in there and the qualifications. But what we're looking at here, I think this line I'm tracing here is 2021 is a really odd counter seasonal pattern in cattle prices. Normally a normal seasonal pattern might look more like something like this that we saw two years ago, where you get the strongest markets, cattle markets in say early spring sometime and then you hit them hard and drive them down in the summertime. And as you can tell, this is nothing like the normal. So this is what creates trading opportunities. You know, you have people who are intensely focused on what the market usually does. And uh, when the market does something unusual, then it catches people off guard. And, and so this is gonna create a, a trading opportunity, this, this, this weird pattern in the cash cow market, I think. And the board's starting to catch on to this. Board's starting to catch on. Uh, been a lot of play in the bear spreads. They become really popular just within the last, I don't know, what do you think, Tom? 30 days or less, maybe. You're on mute, Tom, if you're um, The uh, anyway, the, it's the the bear spread activity has been has been picking up. Uh, probably got a long way to go, but you know, as a consequence, if if you want to flip to the next slide here, Jeff, that's the last one I got. I think on the 
cattle market. What this is, is uh, it is simply the futures price minus my forecast of the cash cattle market. And what this is saying is that you know, this start January, uh, this February contract looks like pretty fairly priced. The April contract looks like it's too rich where it is. Same, same way for the June. On the other hand, the back end, the August contract still looks like it's undervalued. So what, what I think is happening here is that the market is, you know, it knows that we've got this reduced supply coming down the road. It's, it is a little bit impatient in building that in. It's building it in too quickly is what it's doing. So it's, uh, it's getting bearish or getting bullish a little bit too early in the game is what I think. But this is sort of a picture of uh, this, I guess, would summarize everything that, uh, that I'm seeing in the cattle market and comparing it to where the board is and looking for trade. We lost Kevin for a moment there, Tom, but um, if you could maybe make a comment or two on uh, on the cattle, um, you know, any wrap ups from what he just shared that we uh, should should focus on? I think, you know, he was talking about, you know, the the, the market may be a little bit out over its skis. Um, there's probably some some truth to that. You know, a lot of cattle traders have already started to look at. Um, a lot of the things Kevin applies with his his research, and I think the market is has already been reacting to it. So that's, that's right. Know, yeah. yeah. People are going to consistently react to the markets. And I think the one point that he made earlier about his forecasting model is that we're taking information at its face value. That is what we know today and not trying to add in wild guesses, but rather take real time, real world information that our customers ultimately then have to make their, Quarter one, two, three, four pricing decisions based on. Yeah, I think, exactly. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I think you, like Kevin says, you have to take the available information, plug it in, um, you know, into your forecasting model, and just you know be vigilant, you know, and, and understand that we're in a a very dynamic situation with you know there's a lot of moving parts to what's going on. You know, a weaker dollar, China, um, the grain, you know, feed prices are you know you know, very high, um, you know, COVID still a factor, you know, um, so all those things will, will continue to like, you know, monitor vigilantly and, and just, you know, use these forecasts that Kevin puts together and he's been doing it for a long time. So they're pretty reliable. Um, but use these forecasts as sort of a baseline and just continue to, 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 you know, follow things as the year progresses. And, you know, We've been, all been around the business long enough to know that, you know, the, the, the old saying, the best laid plans or the best laid forecasts, you know, uh, sometimes don't often work out, um, you know, but that's not because of, of uh, you know, unreliability of the data. It's because, uh, you know, the situation changes. There's, uh, you know, a, a disease outbreak or the dollar crashes. <clears throat> all those things have to be, you know, looked at and, uh, you know, we have to stay on top of them, um, but this for, these forecasts, I think, are the baseline for what we are going to put in front of customers and try to you know use as a guide um, for, yeah. for producers and end users. That's great. No, I think this is a, this is a good baseline. Go ahead, Kevin. You have one last thought on cattle. We'll move over to hogs. Well, I just wanted to follow up and say that this is um, uh, this is um, the virtue of of you know int intensive statistical modeling is because when you get those shocks to the system, when you get those things coming along that you hadn't expected, it allows you to, to make adjustments quickly and measure their impacts quickly. And so you know responding quickly to things like that is a big part of the game that we're playing here. So yeah, if you wanna move on to the hog market, Jeff, we can- Let's do it. Um, show you a really, really, you know, this is not just from 30,000 This is where all the this fun is... starts, right? You, start, you know, you get into <laughs> ASF and everything else. I mean, uh, up until now, we've just uh, kind of scratched the surface. Let's go. Right, right. And and the only point to be made here is that, uh, okay, we got a year-over-year a -year decline 
in the market hog inventory on December 1st. And that was the first, believe it or not, that was the first material decline, year over year decline in the market hog inventory in six years. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't know how many quarters that amounts to, but you see the picture. That's the only reason I put it up there. You know, we got, we do have, you know, this, the, the, the hog herd was cut back because of the coronavirus. Um, you had, you had a lot of destruction of, of newborn pigs. You know, you had to cut it off some, you had to cut off the supply somewhere because the packing plants wouldn't take them. So this, uh, like I said, we're dealing with a smaller market hog inventory than we had last year. That kind of sets the groundwork for the, I think the slaughter projections are on the next, uh, next slide, Jeff, you want to flip that over. Uh, 2021 is this line that starts right here. January, February, March, it goes on through September. So we're going to get the, the seasonal decline in the hog slaughter um, like we usually do. Uh, you know, once again, I'm taking the USDA's pig crop estimates at face value when I, when I plug these projections into the, the forecasting equation. Uh, we've had a, some hogs that carried over into January, not because the hog supply is backed up in a major way, but because this year we uh, pilot the Christmas and New Year's ske production schedules were extraordinarily light, simply because Christmas fell on a Friday. So most plants took not only Friday off, but Saturday as well. Uh, so we've got, we've had a little bubble here, but so... The, the, the other point I wanted to make here is that um, we do have a, a reduction. We're looking at a reduction in hog slaughter versus a year ago, at least through the summer. But this is not an extremely small hog supply. You know, we're, we, we're taking it down from record levels is what we're doing. So these are the, the slaughter projections that I'm plugging into the forecasting equations. Look at the next one. Okay. This is uh, the equivalent picture that I showed you in the beef market a minute ago, um, showing the actual monthly pork exports, total U.S. pork exports for 2019 and 2020. And then my guess of what they will look like in 2021, which is this series right here. The uh, pork exports, whenever you hear something about pork exports, it's a much bigger deal in the, in the hog and pork markets than it is in the cattle. And that's because a much, much greater percentage of pork production is exported. In other words, the pork market is much more heavily dependent on the export business than, than the beef market is. What, what is it, Tom? Uh, something like 27% of right. pork production is being exported. Is that about what it is now? I think that's about right. And, and this is not all about China. This is not all about China either. I mean, China uh, is the biggest pork export customer. Mexico is, Mexico is big. Mexico's number two, mm -hmm. right? Japan's number three, Canada fourth, Korea fifth. But uh, China in the first quarter here, China will, I say only put quotation marks around that account for 20, 25% of all US pork exports. So China's a big deal, not the only deal though, not the only story. And the next, um, so you know, let me back up one second before we look at China yeah. exports to China. Uh, we, are, we are factoring in about an 8% year over year decline in pork exports in the first quarter. That shifts over to slightly positive, like plus two or 3% in both the second and third quarters. But the reason for the year over year reduction here in the first quarter is has got a lot to do with China. So now we can look at the next picture, which shows the pork exports to China. I know Tom's got some pretty interesting thoughts about um, the trajectory of this curve, but what 
what the basic assumption is here that's reflected in this projection um, is that China's hog herd is definitely rebuilding and it is definitely rebuilding aggressively. But uh, the, the uh, laws of biology work the same there as they do here. You know, it takes basically 10 months to produce a market hog from conception to slaughter. They don't have any superhuman growth hormones over there that they're feeding these things? No, I'm sure that Kim Jong-un in Korea does. Okay. So not China. But uh, they, the, you know, they, they, they started the herd rebuilding in earnest, what would you say about a year ago, Tom? Yeah, about that. So, you know, Definitely the trend is upward in Chinese pork production. It takes a little while though to get that ramped up. I mean, they're building huge hog farms over there. State of the art, state of the art hog farms, state of the art packing plants. They're huge. And this is all being developed from what has traditionally been like a backyard pig industry over there. So yeah. You know what? What I wanted to demonstrate here was that uh, well, I'm, I'm I'm factoring in a gradual decline in demand from China for imported pork. Including there, Kevin, there were, there were, Kevin and Jeff, there were um, while well, we're on this topic of exports and China's rebuild. Um, I think <clears throat> there's a couple things you know that that uh, could change this, right? I mean, we we all have seen. Uh, you know, where, where hog prices stand currently in China, they haven't come off very hard from the record highs, right. even though China claims that uh, there's been a huge rebuild, you don't see it in the, in the, in the evidence, you don't see the evidence of it in, in, in price, right? Um, so that's something that I guess to keep an eye on, right? I mean, if, if uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, we see the, the demand pull on the grain market. So we know the, the effort is there and they're trying to rebuild, but we don't see a big turndown in, in, in prices yet. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on. <clears throat> um, in terms of exports too, you know, we, we know that, that, you know, Europe still has a big problem with uh, African swine fever, Germany's out. Um, you know, is that going to continue to spread? Is that going to knock Spain out of the picture? Um, so, you know, and then I think a couple of weeks ago, one of the presentations we saw um, talked a little bit about, you know, the, the, the incoming administration and uh, their, their stance towards tariffs in China and, you know, the current tax on U.S. pork is about 45%. If we, you know, made nice with China, took the tariffs off, and they responded or reciprocated and took the tax off of the pork, it would move that from a 45% to a 17% tax. You know, I said at the end of the day, you know, uh, hog supplies or pork supplies globally have shrunk. I, I would say that's a pretty accurate statement, right? I mean, between what occurred in China with African swine fever, um, our, our pig herds down here, um, there's a lot of, still a lot of discussion about whether or not the USDA's forecast of a 3% drop in uh, the breeding herd is accurate. A lot of people think it's closer to six or seven. So, you know, these are the things, I guess, that, you know, you sort of continue to watch um, and, 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 you know, the dollar is also could be a big factor um, to see if, if indeed exports to China do, you know, come off. Um, you know, if they don't, you know, or if they if they're anywhere near where they were a year ago, which doesn't seem like it's probable, um, you know, hog market here is too cheap. It'll be interesting uh, to track track along with that. And I think uh, there's a lot of data that uh, we're going to be tracking to ultimately publish out on, you know, how those, how the prices all compare. You know, I think there was one note, uh, the Chinese are making something like $350 a, a head on their hog sales, something along those lines. Kevin, is that, is that the most yeah, accurate number? Yeah, that's about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so, about right. Yeah, right now they're making money hand over fist over there. So we'll have to see how that trend uh, continues or, or reverts. So you can change to the next picture. Yep. 
uh, which is the wholesale pork demand. And this um, wholesale pork demand is by its nature volatile. I'm talking about at the wholesale level. And that's because about half the hog carcass is you know, what you could be classified as a raw material. You know, like raw hams go into further processing to make the finished product. Uh, bellies are a raw material. They're used to make bacon. So the, the uh, same way, same thing goes for trimmings. You know, the, so the demand is inelastic. So therefore this wholesale demand index is more volatile than it is in the beef market, but it's been exceptionally volatile lately for the, all of the reasons that I don't have to tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and my assumption here, I wanted to show you what it is. This would be that block from January through September uh, 2021, right there. I'm plugging in just kind of middle of the road rates of demand for pork at the wholesale level. I mean, it will stabilize. It's not always going to be jumping around the way it is now. And I'm very anxious for that day to come. It makes uh, prices easier to forecast, but I'm, I'm expecting what I'm, what I'm plugging into my forecast here are some pretty healthy rates of wholesale pork demand. Just nothing spectacular. Okay, next one. Okay. This is a chart of the, this is a daily chart of the CME lean hog index, which is of course what the CME futures contract settles to. And I just wanted to show, you know, to put this in perspective right now, you know, the, this chart is basically bounded between from 45 up to about 85 here for the most part for the past five years. <clears throat> so we're right about in the middle of it, that range right now. But I do want to point out that you look at where the June, July, and August contracts were all trading, at least coming into today. They were all right up here, all right up here, 85, 86. So that automatically tells you that the board's got some pretty bullish news priced into it. The next picture um, will show you the, uh, you know, my forecast of the monthly average CME index uh, values. This will be 2021, starting with 66 here in January. Um, my guess is that the high monthly average comes along in June at about 83, I believe that is, and then tails off from there. Well, what the board's, the board's got much more than that priced into it right now, particularly in the August contract. So that uh, point of view is reflected in the, the final slide that I have here. Yeah. In which, uh, honest to God, it looks to me like when I put together the as most objective forecast that I can, and that assumes that this December, February pig crop is pretty much as USDA told us that it would be, then uh, it looks like the August contracts, $10 too high right now. I'll go ahead and say it. July is about $6 too high. So what's happening here? You know, what, what is it that everybody's so bullish about? Well, they're bullish about um, the corn market, feed costs going up, which means that hog prices go up and that much is true, but it doesn't mean that hog prices go up right away. There's virtually nothing that you can do. There's virtually nothing that, that you can do to affect the winter pig crop right now. I mean, those pigs are for the most part on the ground already. Um, uh, uh, this sharp increase in feed, feed costs could bring along more herd liquidation. And what would happen first is that the fewer sows and gilts would be bred. Okay, if you start that right now in January, it's not gonna affect the market hog supply until you get to November or October. You have to now, think that uh, any producer is likely hedged further out on their corn needs. If they knew they were gonna raise the hogs, good. right? Yeah, yeah, they should be. And so if they've hedged out, then even though the price the price here would ultimately be too high and unless they're gonna get short squeezed um, on the other side. But you know, uh, just just in conversations with um, clients who are producers, 
Um, the one thing to me that's stood out, and we've had this discussion, is that the industry is incredibly resilient. I mean, look at what the hog industry had thrown at it in 2020, and look what our supplies look like. I mean, they're down, but you know, the chaos we saw earlier in the year, you'd think it would have been, you know, all the stories we heard, you know, you, you would think that the hog supply would have been impacted more, but it isn't. I mean, supplies are, are down, but they're still like Kevin says, they're, you know, our slaughters are coming off record high levels. So, um, you know, that, that sort of leads me to believe that, you know, Kevin's forecast at least through, you know, July and August might be pretty accurate. But, you know, talk to a lot of people. There are people that are incredibly bullish. They doubt the pig crop. Um, they, they doubt China and the recovery. Um, they look at the weak dollar. They look at, generally speaking, you know, government policy, the policies that are inflationary and that it's all going to, that is all going to work its way into commodity prices, including, you know, beef and pork. So there's, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, people out there that, you know, don't exactly see what we see. They see something a lot more bullish and, and those bets are being laid in the market right now. You can see it, you know, the deferred hog market, the deferred hog futures are, you know, just off contract highs. And uh, so, you know, we'll see how this all plays out. But like I said earlier, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, we go with a baseline forecast that Kevin's using from the information he has and then we look to see what develops. We look and look at, you know, you know, disease problems here in China. We look at, you know, um, is the recovery in China really going the way they claim it is? And are they going to be able to um, slow their exports from the U.S.? There's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, we just have to be uh, aware of what those are and, and just be vigilant and just, you know, keep stay informed. Two, uh, two quick questions for you guys here as we uh, move off the slides and uh, chat here just a few more minutes before we wrap up. So we have really two new <clears throat> futures contracts that have come into play this year. Uh, well, I guess last year uh, is the first is the CME pork cutout and uh, ultimately how is how that, that contract uh, is reflected in these prices and what how traders are going to leverage and utilize that in new information. That's one. And the second is uh, we have the launch of the uh, Chinese port contract there in China, where in fact now we have a chance to see how some of the big players in China are betting on their forward forecast. So I'm wondering uh, on that China point is Kevin, are you going to start to uh, do price forecasts on Chinese hog futures? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I laugh when I say this, but yeah, I mean, why not? Why yeah. not? The problem is, Jeff, there it's it's a, it's extremely difficult to get any price history and the reliable China. information I mean, China coming to, from to Chinese to government, that, right? That. And it's and it just doesn't exist, right? So it's hard it's hard to put prices in perspective when you got no perspective. Yeah, <laughs> fair. We saw okay, well, and in, in, uh, coming back to our world, which is a reliable world, we have this the pork cutout, which is priced weekly, and you can uh, go in and uh, price daily, excuse me, but uh, you can uh, uh, leverage the now CME pork cutout contract. How would you suggest uh, people use that new information, and how are you going to start to use it in your forecasting? Well, that contract is a winner. It's got everything going for it. The open interest is about 1,100 contracts. So it's built up to that level. I mean, it's nothing compared with how it was your like orange but juice. It's, well, it's only been in existence for what, two months? Yeah, November, so, I think. Yeah, October. Yeah, not very long. Yeah. What it's really got going for it, though, is that the majority of hog producers are now using the cutout value to formulate the price of their hogs as opposed to a cash hog quote. So hog producers have already made that, that switch, that transition. So uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, that poor cutout value. 
Yeah, and I think the the key to it is, uh, you know, we've had some customers trading it. It is very liquid. Uh, you, you need to be sure to get your pricing in there correctly. You know, work with the, your trade desks and brokers and risk managers to, uh, uh, you know, really determine how to use that contract. I know a lot of people uh, prefer to price based upon weekly or even daily settlements where that contract simply settles, my understanding, is at one point in time. And so there's big differences what we've seen between yeah. the uh, way that a actual um, operation may use their, the, the USDA cutout versus the CME cutout futures. So there's, there's some nuances that need to be understood. Yeah. Great. Um, gentlemen, we're uh, running flush up on time. I think we've uh, covered quite a bit of information here today. Uh, is there uh, any final thoughts that we want to put on here before I get to uh, my rapid fire questions for both of you? Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, really to have much more to add than, than you know, I think um, than what we talked about earlier is just, you know, stay focused on, you um, uh, what Kevin's forecasting and just keep an eye on, on, you know, the markets and, you know, outside, uh, the U S and inside the U S, um, for, you know, ideas that could, you know, make us change, uh, these price forecasts, you know, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, uh, you know, provide guidance for, you know, users and, and uh, producers and, and um, make them aware of any changes that, uh, so they can protect, uh, protect themselves from any adverse price moves. And, uh, you know, as hard as we try to, to forecast things, everybody knows that it's a difficult game because uh, things can change pretty quickly. You know, we've seen it, you know, time and again over the last, you know, decade and a half or two decades with, uh, you know, all the diseases we mentioned, you know, uh, you know, uh, hoof and mouth disease in Taiwan, uh, mad cow, bird flu. I mean, you know, PEDS, uh, African swine fever. I mean, we've, we've, we've had, we've, the markets, uh, you know, have had a lot of things thrown at them over the past, you know, a couple of decades and, uh, all those things have been very disruptive. So, you know, the forecast is a forecast, um, but we just have to keep our eye on, anything that could change it so that's good uh to kevin any final thoughts uh, other than the tom just shared before we get the rapid fire no we covered it well tom <laughs> well we appreciate the those slides uh, i mean obviously the work you put in week in week out uh, your research is available uh for for outside consumption they can obviously contact uh, yourself <laughs> Uh, via our RCM Ag Services website and or contact uh, uh, to be able to you know receive more more regular updates from you, um, gentlemen. Couple rapid fire questions. We'll start with market related and then we'll jump into uh, random thoughts. So first, corn prices today, December twenty one, corn prices closed at four fifty five. Higher or lower by July? Uh, if I had a, you put a gun to my head. Yes, I'd sir. Say, There's a gun. Yeah, they're moving higher, I think. Higher, higher yeah. by July. Tom, how about you, Kevin? What was the question? Corn, I, I, cor I, December corn closed at 4.55 today. Higher or lower by July? Higher. Higher. Wow. Uh oh, yeah. we all agree. That's, we all agree. Yeah. yeah. I, think, uh, I didn't even hear your answer, so that was an honest one. <laughs> I said, I, I think you're going higher. Forth. That's good. All right, we'll see. Uh, next, next question is uh, we're going to move off off markets and we're going to jump into uh, favorites. Tom, favorite Chicago restaurant? Boy, that's a good one. Um, there's so many good ones. Uh, huh. I, I hate to say Gibson's because it sounds so. Uh, <laughs> like everybody would say that, but it's a great restaurant, and actually, the biggest the, piece of meat you're ever going to see. Put yeah, in your face. Well, That's yeah, right. Yeah, Gibson's Italia in the in the in the uh, lower level of the, the building my wife works in. It's a pretty nice restaurant. Yeah, as like, long as you get the uh, you get the three um, blue cheese olives in your martini along with that steak, it's it's the way to go. How about you, Kevin? Favorite Chicago restaurant? Chicago guy. Kevin's going to say the, the wiener circle. 
<laughs> he might have dropped uh, off. I might have lost him right at the fun part. Oh boy, that's okay. Yeah, even if it was a wiener circle, we could, you know, maybe we catch him there before a ball game or something along those lines. Um, oh, he's coming back. Kevin, yeah. favorite favorite yeah. Chicago restaurant. Well, uh, when people used to travel, I always took my to Gibson's. We can get a huge steak and an even bigger <laughs> piece of we cake. Can't agree. Kevin, we can't. So how can you beat that? Thing. You guys are too. You guys are just like too good of friends or something. Long lost brothers. That's funny. Yeah. I don't think you heard Tom. That's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty. Well, I know funny. Kevin likes to hear Tom. Yeah, there's some, but this is like the, this is like the newlywed game, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I'll tell you, my favorite is uh, it's not in the steak department. It's Pequod's Pizza. If people have never had Pequod's, uh, they don't ship it out like uh, uh, Lumonati's or anything else. You have to come to Chicago to get it. And um, I've I'll tell you guys an inside secret. I, I live in Ohio, as you know. I actually, on a regular basis, will go. Uh, order a large cheese or a large pepperoni pizza to my hotel room, put it in the freezer and bring it home on the plane to the kids. They love it. So anyway. Nice. <laughs> um, last, uh, last question. If you, uh, your favorite extreme sport, whether one that you either are involved in or wish you could do in another life, Kevin, you go first. Oh, we lost him again. <laughs> No worries. See, I wonder if you'll say the same thing go, as you, Tom. Go ahead. Yeah, extreme sport. Uh, extreme sport. Skydiving, uh, skiing. You you come up with it. I don't know. Hella skiing. I've never yes. done that before. I have friends that do that, and I, I've, they've invited me, but I'm like, I don't know if I could quite do that. <laughs> hey, that's another life then. Hey, you know, actually, uh, funny you bring that up. I plan to do it for my 40th birthday. Life got in the way. But I've uh, my wife's committed that uh, by the 45th birthday I'm allowed to uh, you know throw my body down off a mountain out of a helicopter. How about jumping off a uh, what, what is it called uh, when you jump off a cliff with a with a rope tied to you? What is that called? Oh, uh, bungee jumping. Oh, bungee jumping. Yeah, yeah. That, that looks really fun until you until the the cord snaps. <laughs> Let's hope not. But uh, you know, Kevin, your favorite uh, favorite extreme sport, one that you've either done yourself or would like to do in another life? I'm going to answer for Kevin. It's probably bull riding. <laughs> bull riding? No. I think, no. I think Kevin would be really good at that. I'm a, we're going to find a, a cowboy that's going to let you ride one of his bulls. Welcome you guys back anytime. So thank you for the time and um, enjoy the rest of your week. Let's, let's uh, make it a great week. Yeah, thanks for organizing. Hope, hope it's helpful. Yeah, thank you. listening to The Hedged Edge. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at ag underscore RCM, like our Facebook page under RCM Ag Services, and visit our website, read our blog, and subscribe to our newsletter at rcmagservices.com. If you like our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear them. 